Well, Dr. Rick Callishaw, he was raised in a farming community in uh, Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, and he received his BS in biology at Oregon State University. Then he switched camps and he moved on over to the University of Oregon and received his PhD in biology there. Um, some details about his studies there. Also, he held positions with the Forest Service, the National, National Marine Fisheries Service, and he was a Peace Corps volunteer in Guatemala from 92 to 94. So his farming background served him very well in that uh, endeavor as he worked with subsistence farmers to battle the runaway soil erosion that they were um, having that was decimating their countryside. So it gave him a whole new perspective uh, about the disparity of the human condition and the responsibilities that come with having an abundance of resources and opportunities that so many on our planet live and die without. So, you know, our, our situation in the state's very different from those sure. farmers that he worked with in Guatemala. Well, he came to Southwestern College after he received his doctorate, and he's been part of the biology faculty for, I think, now probably close to 14 years. Yeah, it's actually 18 years Oh, now. is it 18? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay, great. Well, time does fly. It does, yeah. This was written uh, early. Well, I don't know where the 12 comes from. It's yeah. certainly been longer than 12. Put it that way. Yeah, I, I think I had it when, when you were here the last time. Maybe so. Maybe yeah. we didn't check that out. Yeah. And he teaches a variety of courses for biology majors, including marine biology, freshwater biology, microbiology, and several biology seminars. He also teaches two environmental, uh, environmental science courses that are part of the college's general education program. <laughs> And he loves the opportunity to, to share his passion with non-science uh, major students and the general public. So we're very happy to have him here today. And uh, sure. we will let him take it away. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, if you want, we can pull this over here. Oh, okay. That's fine. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, you can see your slides better. Sure. Thank you. Um, so it's been um, about a year and a half, I guess, it's uh, been since I talked to you last. And it's obviously lots of things have happened between then and now, uh, both climate-related and not. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the climate-related stuff. And there is some exciting news. I think the last time we uh, talked, um, there wasn't a whole lot of um, mobilization or, or um, um, serious talk among conservative lawmakers about climate change. Uh, fortunately, that's changed. Um, in our recent meetings with the, the Ron Estes office and the Jerry Moran office, um, underscore that. Um, what's nice about our meetings now, rather than talking about the science of climate change and whether climate change is real or not, or humans are, involved, are causing it, now we're talking about solutions, right? And so it's a very different experience. Um, and you know, even cons most conservative lawmakers, not all, um, many conservative lawmakers are realizing that uh, something has to be done. And they're hearing that from their constituents, mm -hmm. particularly the young uh, GOP, the sort of the millennial GOP are demanding action. So that's very exciting, because those are future voters. Those are gonna be the voters down the road for a long time. And so there's, you know, there is some movement on the, on the seriousness of climate change and something to do about it. Uh, even Ron Estes, our representative, um, <laughs> attended a climate conference, a wow. conservative climate conference in Utah. Um, and, uh, and he came back, it was right before our last meeting with his office, and we talked with them, and it was just a very different, um, different conversation with that office, because it's been, for the most part, he, uh, there's been a lot of reluctance to talk about solutions in that office. But even, even in, in Ron Estes' uh, office with his aides, a very different conversation. And also, of course, having a, um, having a president in the White House that is serious about climate change and mm -hmm. is putting climate high on his priority list for all legislation, uh, particularly the infrastructure bill that you're probably familiar with, which has about $630 billion uh, related to climate. Wow. Uh, and so, uh, and so and climate is embedded in a lot of the, uh, of the legislation. As I'll point out here in a little bit, businesses and corporations, even fossil fuel companies, are calling for a, even a price on carbon. 
Now, there are reasons for doing that. Uh, could be um, um, questionable, but uh, but nonetheless, even saying even even a fossil Exxon Mobil coming out and saying that a price on carbon is uh, likely essential um, going forward. So there's you know you can we can debate what that means, uh, but the fact that they even said it out loud, right, put it out there, says something, right. So it's uh, anyway, so there's some exciting things happening. Unfortunately, it's not happening fast enough. I follow climate, I'm not a climatologist, but I follow climate science pretty closely. And every week, um, you know, it's the, the situation that we're in becomes more grim. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the need for action, bold action now, becomes uh, more and more uh, critical. Maybe it's... <clears throat> there we go. Um, so a little bit about, you kind of heard my story. Um, I've been in, uh, concerned about climate change since under, actually my undergraduate year. I had a professor, one of my professors was talking about climate change, how it was affecting amphibian populations. So he's a frog, frog specialist. And so I was interested in amphibians and I learned a lot about climate change early on. And then over the years, uh, my concern and my, my understanding and concern about climate change has increased. And so now it's pretty much embedded in all my courses. Climate, you have to talk about climate change if you're talking about biology, because every biological system is affected by it. And um, I, I think I shared a, a something like this with you last time. Uh, the Yale uh, Program of Climate Change Communication, a really great resource if you're interested in kind of knowing public opinion about, cl uh, about climate. Uh, just type in Yale Program at Climate Change and it'll take you right to it. But a great resource. And they, They've been following something, what they call the Six Americas, Global Warming Six Americas, where they basically break up the U.S. population into different, um, six different camps, dismissive, doubtful, disengaged, cautious, concerned, and alarmed about climate change. Uh, and you can see that um, over, um, over recent years, right, the, the number of people alarmed and cautious um, has increased, not at a fast rate, but at a steady rate. Um, and then today, the number of alarm almost quarter of people are, are of, of, of the U.S. population is alarmed, um, and, or if we factor in the concern, right, almost 60% uh, of people um, think climate change is, is a real thing. And this includes both uh, conservatives and progressives, right, Democrats and Republicans. Um, so the, the, the concern of climate change is building, probably more among progressives and Democrats than Republicans, but even among Republican po um, populations, things are happening. And I'm not going to get into too much of the science. I did, I did that last time, talked more about the science. Pretty much the debate about climate change is over um, in ter among scientists. Um, and that not only is that climate change is happening, but it, that it's anthropogenic. That, it, that just means, it's, it's a fancy word for human caused. Um, and this is happening. And this is not a belief that uh, scientists have, right? This is based on fact. This is based on evidence. And a, and a, and a body of evidence that comes from lots of different types of data. Um, and, um, and so climate change is real, and we know what the biggest driver is. Um, it's fossil fuel use. Uh, and this is just reaching all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century, and you can see that uh, over the course of that time, right, our use of fossil fuels um, has increased. Uh, fortunately, um, our use of coal is beginning. We're seeing some change. Obviously, everything's going up, but what you're seeing as we get closer to where we are today, coal is kind of the end decline natural gas obviously is filling that gap. Um, <clears throat> this is good news. Moving away from coal is essential. Coal is very dirty, produces lots of greenhouse gases, and natural gas is about 30% cleaner. So that's a good thing if we're th thinking about reducing our emissions. But still, right, our fossil fuel use is still a big part of our energy sector. That has to change. We need to move away from fossil fuel use as fast as we can. And certainly, you know, uh, eliminating coal use uh, makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> the rise in wind and solar has been huge, uh, and that's been driving a lot of the um, kind of leveling out the fossil fuel use. Uh, but the growth of wind and solar in Kansas, but even in other states, uh, has uh, is on a sort of an exponential rise, which is good news because it helps us move away and transition away from fossil fuels. The problem with uh, with fossil fuels and our use of it is that it's so embedded into our economy that we are a fossil fuel co economy. And so it's hard to separate, begin pulling fossil fuels out. Uh, as you've, and, and many, there are different ways of doing that, but probably the most effective way 
uh, to do that is by putting a price on carbon, and that's something we're going to be talking about today. That'll put a market signal that basically will steal the market away from fossil fuel intensive products to fossil fuel uh, products with fewer fossil fuels embedded into them. And this is just a, a, a timeline uh, just showing global warming reaching all the way back to that uh, uh, the, um, the beginning of the 20th century. And, and warming is uh, happening, but you also notice that warming is accelerating. That is, as we get closer and closer to where we are today, more and more of the planet is going red and orange. Um, and right now, many scientists think we're at a tipping point. You maybe have heard that word tipping point in the news. Um, it's becoming more, um, you know, more mainstream. And that just means we're, we're potentially approaching a point where if we go past a certain amount of warming, we're going to kind of slip into a different, a different planet that we won't be able to get out of. Uh, and there's lots of indicators that suggest that we're getting very close to that. And so action now is essential. Uh, global temperatures, as you may have heard in the news, have been on the rise, and the you know the ten hottest years are on on record, right? Have been uh, in the in this um, in this century, and most of the warming uh, hottest years are in the last five uh, years, right? So things are on the rise globally, and also in the United States, right? So we are seeing that signal, that planetary signal, is re registering not only globally but even um, at, at the um, at the U.S. level as well. All right, so things are progressing, things are accelerating, and, and we need to take action. And the thing is, is that climate change is not something that we're predicting to happen. It's happening right now. It's affecting all aspects of life. I'm not going to read all of these, but um, you can see that this is the global problem, so I, I guess we shouldn't be so surprised that it has global effects and multiple effects, and really affecting everything about how the planet works. Um, climate change is kind of like a, a multiplier, an amplifier. Um, that is, it not only does it cause its own problems, but it makes existing problems worse. Um, and the longer we go, obviously heating the planet up is one problem, but that causes a chain reaction, so to speak, throughout the Earth's system. And it leads to all sorts of changes in the natural communities, but also puts, threatens public communities, society. Um, not only at, in terms of public health uh, and hurting the economy, but also geopolitical insecurity. Um, you know, we got a taste, we're getting a taste of that with at the southern border right now, right? People, why are people moving, move, fleeing the South Central America? Well, they've been hit by like three hurricanes, right, in the last, you know, th four, five years. They're already poor. Uh, and so they're on the move. And that's only going to get worse. Um, there's some... Um, by 2050, right, the, you know, events like the, uh, the Syrian refugees uh, fleeing their country, which also has an, an environmental climate change related factor, those types of events are going to become more and more common. Um, and we're seeing that even at, um, at our, our um, southern border. And what really pains me is that the people that are going to feel it the most, right, are the people that, that, that contributed nothing to this problem, right? <laughs> These are the people that, that have no, no, no skin in the game, right, in terms of the fossil fuel emissions, um, yet they're going to feel the brunt of it, right? So um, I, I, feel, I, have, I feel a moral responsibility to act on climate change, in, in, not only at, at the state level, but globally um, <clears throat> going forward. And, it, you know, climate change threatens the Kansas way of life in all aspects of it. Um, Kansas is going to, it could be a really, is, with, in, with inaction on climate change, Kansas is a big loser. Action on climate change, Kansas is a big winner, right? Because it plays to our strengths. Um, not only does action on climate change help agriculture, but it also makes uh, Kansas potentially a power supplier in terms of solar and wind. We're sitting on a gold mine, essentially, of, of a resource that under, given the right changes in the marketplace could really make uh, um, Kansas um, six, uh, a, a, a profitable and, and influential state in and of itself. But inaction has lots of problems, and particularly with the agriculture, how it's going to, well, we're already seeing that, right? It's not like we, this is predicted to happen. We're seeing, you know, ch uh, extreme precipitation events becoming more frequently, uh, and then long periods of, of dry and, and aridity uh, leading to radical uh, uh, significant shifts in the soil moisture 
um, and obviously that plays into uh, food production, and then just increased stress on food, water economy, and public health. All of these things increase um, as we go forward. Um, and, and really, the action that is the amount of warming that is predicted here is, is, is probably more on the high end, right? It's a pretty good size range, 3.6 to 5.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Right now, we're on the trajectory of hitting that, that high point of that range. Um, and so we, you know, again, we have uh, Kansas stands to lose a lot um, of what makes, it, what makes Kansas wonderful um, is at risk. And then just the economic costs of inaction are on the rise. Um, this is showing um, um, every, every line is a year, and these are a billion dollar, number of billion dollar disasters uh, that are climate related. Uh, and, it, and the red one here is 2020, right, or last year. Uh, we had uh, all those hurricanes and the wildfires um, and so forth. So the question is how many, how long can we do this, right? How long can we sustain these sorts of uh, economic costs of inaction? Now, of course you hear conservative lawmakers say, well, any action on climate change is going to hurt the economy. Think about that. I mean, think about that comment. Or it's going to be a job killer. I mean, they, they, there's no evidence for that. In fact, there's plenty of evidence that suggests that action on climate change makes great economic sense. Mm -hmm. um, be, it's, it's how you do it. I mean, it's, it's what kind of action you do. Um, and so anyway, so we're at a, at a crossroads, really, right? Do we want to continue on this path, uh, making the argument that um, it's, it, action on climate change is too expensive, and we'll just kind of you know, weather the storm as we go into the future? Um, scientists. And economists say uh, that's a fool's game, um, and it puts not only the U.S. at risk, but even uh, the planet. So anyway, everything's going up, right? That's all. Have you noticed all these all these curves are they're going up, um, and that's just because of the magnifying effect of climate change. And even Kansas, uh, number of billion dollar disasters in Kansas, broken down by decades, um, 2010 or the the, the last uh, 10 years have been. Um, much greater, right, in terms of the number of these billion dollar disasters, right, over almost 40 uh, billion dollars in disasters in that decade uh, of, of, of the 20, 2010 to 2020. It's almost doubled it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, and this is pretty much the, 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 the nation, right? Yeah. I mean, we could just change, put rather the Kansas, U.S., and, and most states, right, are, are showing this trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the fear of, of tipping points, something I, I talked about um, a little bit ago. Um, that is, we, as we continue to warm up the planet and put more and more uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, at what point are we going to sort of move, put, push past a threshold? And that's what a tipping point is. Basically, a threshold's past which there is large, and um, I should, that should be bolded and mm -hmm. quoted and underlined, irreversible changes. That is, what that means is that if we get past a tipping point, it doesn't matter what we do, what action we take to reduce emissions, um, the, 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 the Earth system is basically tipped over into a different state out of which it cannot come um, <clears throat> return. Uh, and once that happens, then, you know, it's, it's not game over. It's all about adaptation, right? It's no longer mitigation. It's no longer action to reduce emissions. At that point, Everything is uh, off the off the table in terms of what are we going to do about it, and the three biggest uh, tipping points, and these are ones you probably heard if, in uh, in the news, particularly ice sheet melting mm -hmm. in Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, we're getting uh, accelerating ice melt, uh, ice sheet melt occurring in those locations, uh, but we're also seeing as the most of the warming is taking place at high latitudes, mm -hmm. up in northern Canada and Siberia, we're seeing. Uh, permafrost thawing, and when per permafrost thaws, it releases lots of stored uh, carbon uh, in the soils. Uh, but even the Amazon is drying out as well. It's becoming, rather than being what we call a carbon sink, that is pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, in some parts of the Amazon are becoming a carbon source. Um, and they're not, they're not taking up CO2, they're releasing it because they're drying out. And then something that I've paid close attention to is uh, how, how the oceans are responding to climate change. And we're already, you may have, there was a, I think a, a, a news piece that was getting uh, circulated on the, on the news stations a couple weeks ago 
where the uh, the 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 the, the, the um, what they call the Atlantic uh, turnover system in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, part of the ocean circulation is starting to slow down. You may remember the movie The Day After Tomorrow. Now, you guys remember that when you know the the, the 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 Gulf Stream shut down and the and the Atlantic Ocean froze over in a day, <laughs> and, and, and New York City was you know covered with ice. Um, it's not going to happen that fast. Um, but a change, a slowdown in ocean circulation, that just means it, it, it's basically reducing the ability of the ocean to post seal carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and send it down to the deep ocean where it can be stored. That's slowing down. So all these things, and all of these things are happening, right? These, that's why they're of, of concern. Um, so these are, from a scientific, ecological perspective, um, many people are alarmed. Um, and, that, and as we'll find out, in order to really move away from the possibility of tipping points, the next eight years, it's no longer, I mean, before, when it was more than 10, it seemed like we have a long time. But now we're eight years. We need to, as we need to reduce our emissions by 50%. So it's, it's you know, you know, we, we've, you know, we've been postponing this, pushing it down the road, and, it's, and, and the problem gets bigger as we go forward. So the time for action was yesterday, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're here talking. I mean, we still need to take action, but you know, we should have been acting on this back in the, if we, were, if, if we were started acting on this in the 90s, right, the, the things we would need to do would not be so jolting and wrenching. Um, but you know, it, the, the economy trumped uh, action on climate change for the longest time. Um, but fortunately, you know, Paris Climate Accord did happen in 2015, and it was an effort by um, you know, the countries throughout the world to come together and basically not just say we're going to do something about it, but basically pledging uh, to keep their emissions such that we can keep warming between 1.5 and 2 degrees C to avoid catastrophic uh, impacts. Business as usual, if we just do nothing, we'll get there, we'll get the 2 degrees C by 2030. So we, meaning we're, <laughs> we're running out of time, right? It's another way to do it. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, you may have heard of that term, um, I, that uh, acronym before. These are basically a, um, science, a climate scientists throughout the world. They get together every five or six years and put together a report. They actually had a special report that they made in 2018 that said, uh, in order to um, keep uh, emissions, I mean, keep temperature as close to 1.5 degrees C as possible, we need to, uh, uh, drop global carbon emissions by 50 uh, percent by 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality that is basically net zero that is we're pulling CO as, as much co2 out of the atmosphere as we're putting into the atmosphere <clears throat> now think about that right how long do we have hmm. you know we have essentially nine to eight years right to cut global emissions by 50 percent that's, that's sobering right 50 yeah, percent you know, we, we've done well. The United States has reduced their, their emissions by about 3%, <laughs> you know, at, through the pandemic. Um, and also because the U.S., to, to its credit, we have become more innovative. We have reduced what we call our carbon intensity, the amount of carbon that we have embedded in the products that we make. So we have made some strides, but we need to do a lot more uh, to do that. So what should bold action entail? So what are some things that you think, uh, you think there's one thing we can do that's going to be um, reduced? No, it would have to be many. It'd have to be many, right? And so scientists, rather than talk about a silver bullet, mm -hmm. they talk about silver buckshot. <laughs> now, we need, we need lots, lots of things happening. Mm -hmm. lots of things. Uh, and that's good. Now, think about that. If you have lots of things happening, that, that means you can mobilize the economy and people right. in a variety of different ways. I like to look at the upsides of things, right? So I think of buckshot, I think, well, okay, there's, there's many ways that people can plug into this. Mm -hmm. many, many businesses can plug into this. Many, many corporations can plug into this. Um, so, you know, for me, this is exciting. So what are some things that you think need to be done uh, in order for us to reduce our emissions by 50%? Uh, electric vehicles. So electric vehicles, so that, that is becoming a thing. And um, the infrastructure uh, bill that the Biden administration put forward 
uh, devotes, I think it's like 40 or 50 billion dollars into, into EV uh, development as well as charging stations throughout the, throughout the um, United States. What else? What's another thing you think we should do? electric, or not, I mean, wind and solar energy to yeah. move more, more toward that. Yeah, wind and, wind and solar, but everything else, too, right? There's Wind and solar are the main renewable energy sources, but geothermal is yeah. becoming more, yeah. in some places of the, of the country. Um, even tidal energy is being tapped into on the, on the coastlines. Um, biofuels, or biomass, um, is also another uh, fuel source. Um, Anything else? So yeah, definitely we need a we need a, a portfolio, right, of uh, renewables. Well, because certain parts of the country have right. advantages to That's right. certain right. things that we don't have, obviously. Sure. Yeah, and also kind of coupled with that, um, changing our grid, our electrical grid, right, oh. so that we don't have what we had in Texas, yes. right, mm -hmm. where you know this these centralized uh, uh, power um, distribution centers, right. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of things. Um, but if there's one thing we had to do, right, one thing in order to kind of move the needle, that is really get us a good way towards 50%, is something that Cl Citizens Climate Lobby is all about. Uh, and we think that best first step is putting a price on carbon. And, and so today I'm just gonna share a little bit about Citizens Climate Lobby. Like, like your organization, we're nonpartisan. Um, we don't talk about politics. Um, and we talk about solutions. We're nonprofit, grassroots, uh, and we're an advocacy organization. And what we're advocate, ad, advocating is for national policies uh, to address climate change. Um, it started back in 1994 by a gentleman named Marshall Saunders, who just passed away last year. Uh, but he uh, started small, and today we have about 600 different chapters across the country and about 200,000 volunteers. Right, so it's a large organization, a very engaged organization, and we're focused on relationships with elected officials, both you know, Democrats and Republicans. And we do that with respect, appreciation, gratitude, and optimism. Uh, that is, we, we always make an effort to connect with our member of Congress, as hard as it can be sometimes, um, and you know, setting aside our own political views and trying to work towards this goal, creating the political will for a livable future. Because the good news is, is that we know what this problem is. We know what we need to do. We have everything we need to do it. Right? We don't need to create anything, you know, create new, new technologies to deal with this problem. We got it all. Everything's on the table. What we lack, right, is this. Political, political will. Mm -hmm. And as you know, in Congress right now, there's just not a lot of um, interest in being bipartisan. Um, and what needs to happen is not, not just any policy. We need, we need durable policy, policy that's going to last. Um, and so we're, we're focused on s solutions and not politics. We talk policy, not politics, is sort of our thing. And we think that the best first step is something called carbon fee and dividend. So you, you're all familiar with, familiar with this idea of a carbon tax. And that's something that kind of registers with most people, carbon tax, putting a, a tax on carbon. Carbon fee and dividend is like a tax, but different. And that's different because of the dividend. Um, and so we worked with Congress to reintroduce a bill um, that was in Congress, in the, in the last Congress, called Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And let me, could you hand something out for me? Uh-huh, sure. 